Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you in today's webinar organized by Pragyan Foundation in association with the Global Academy. I am Priyanka Singh, convener of this event today. And just like all of you, I am also very excited about today's topic, psychology of death. Death, the inevitable, the ultimate truth of life, which we know, we think, but we hardly talk about. To throw some light on this very exhilarating topic, we have an apt speaker, Mrs. R. Vasumati. Ms. Vasumati is a research scholar in psychology from the Garden City University, Bangalore. A seasoned veteran in her field, her area of specialization is Indian psychology. Prior to pursuing her doctoral research, she had completed MPhil in public administration as well as masters in counseling psychology. She is also a very successful entrepreneur, having run a preschool in Bangalore for more than 10 years. She also conducts workshops on positive psychology for college and school students. She is also a recipient of Chanakya Award 2022 for her achievements and work in the field of education. So without further delay, let's welcome our speaker, Mrs. R. Vasumati. And in the meantime, I'll request everybody to keep your video and audio off to avoid distraction. So, Ms. Vasumati, can you please unmute yourself and we can start the session? Thank you so much for a very warm welcome, uh, Ms. Pr uh, Priyanka. I thank the organizers of Pragyan Foundation and I welcome all the participants uh, for this uh, very um, what to say, a very intriguing uh, sub subject called psychology of death. I, I welcome everyone to this webinar. I'm R. Vasumati, a research scholar in psychology from Garden City University, Bangalore. Uh, before going into the topic, so I would like to know what sort of emotions arise when we say the word death. Normally, it is associated with fear for many. Uh, people try to avoid telling that word, oh, okay, why should we speak about death now? The reason why we are afraid because we are unaware of what happens about death. When a human mind doesn't know about certain things, then the fear develops. So this webinar is mainly to understand or throw a light on the concept of death. And it is not uh, just to uh, make it like, uh, it is not the end of life. It is just a comma where we are going to travel further. So this uh, is going to be really fun and uh, more knowledgeable as well. And I would be taking you through both Western as well as Eastern philosophies, what or psychology concepts which are speaking about death. Without much further ado, let me uh, go into the webinar. Now, before starting, I would like to tell you a very interesting story uh, by Robert Mohag. So he uh, uh, had narrated a story called Appointment in Samara. So this is a beautiful story which explains the nature of death. So uh, this story happened in Baghdad many hundreds of years ago. So there was a merchant who had a uh, huge uh, uh, servants working from for him and in that one servant was very loyal. And that servant was sent for a very important work to be done from the market by the uh, merchant. But that servant came running very quickly and he fell to the feet of the merchant and cried and sobbing and said, uh, Master, please give me a, a fastest horse you have got. I have to leave the city immediately. So the merchant was puzzled as we are. And uh, he asked, why? What happened? The servant cried and said, no, master, I saw the lady of death and in the market and she showed me some gestures, hand gestures, which I am frightened that she is going to kill me tonight if I stay in Baghdad. So please help me to move away. I have to run away from the city very fast. The merchant tried to convince, but it didn't work. So finally, the merchant gave his best horse and immediately the servant got on his horse and he sped away from Baghdad. And some 
Samara, he reached a city called Samara, which is a very far off city uh, by evening around six o'clock. Meanwhile, since the work was not finished, the merchant had to go to the market in the afternoon. And again, he also met the lady of that city. So he went and he uh, spoke in a very polite voice, uh, lady of death, why did you threaten my servant? He is very good. He never does harm to anybody. Why did you threaten him? The lady of death said in a very calm voice, sir, I didn't threaten him. Actually, I had given, I had told him, I was in fact surprised to see him here because I had an appointment with him at Samara tonight. And how can he be here in Baghdad in the morning? So this story, though it, it is very simple as it seems, but it has a very, very deep insight meaning that nobody can escape from death or whatever ways you do, you cannot move away from death. So this is the story called Appointment in Samara, which explains the nature of death. So before going again into uh, the psychology of death, we'll see certain uh, wordings like what is death and dying? Are they synonymous? Does death, because many in many uh, literatures we see see that it is being interchanged like death and dying are interchanged are they synonymous no they are not synonymous they are not synonymous terms for the death the process of dying starts at birth whereas death is an ultimate cessation or stop to our organs physical death so the ongoing process of cellular and tissue and the regeneration of new tissues take place throughout our lives. And I, it is actually genetically programmed, if you know, it intervals depending on the tissues of our life, okay? So basically that is a dying process. So the process of dying actually starts an irreversible stoppage. That is a permanent stoppage of the heart or the respiration or the brain activity. It is a it is the end of the current life that the body does not move. Your physical body does not move after that. So that is actually uh, death. Then when we see death in many cases can be the elephant in the room. It is a very famous phrase that elephant in the room is you see the elephant. It is so big that everybody can see it, but nobody likes to talk about it. The reason why we uh, why it is like that is in many cultures, uh, we feel that if an individual says death or speaks about death more often, then he or she unconsciously invites death and death is something to be feared of. So you shouldn't speak about death. And in many cases, we have seen people like to um, gain immortality in many of our, uh, even in our scriptures, we have seen many stories in many of our Puranas, we have seen people are longing to gain that immortality. Even though we know whichever thing, be it a human or be it a single grass, dies once it is born in the in this earth. So that is inevitable. But why do we fear? Because we don't understand the process of death. We don't understand what happens after death or what. how can we accept death willingly. So this is a small mm -hmm. idea of showing you how you can welcome or accept speaking about death. So when, uh, when we go further, first one we are going to see is thanatophobia. So thanatophobia is also called as fear of death. So thanatos is a Greek god of death. So anything in death psychology or any uh, such uh, literature, you will see that it is always connected to thanatos. And most of the concepts would also be mentioned as thanato, thanatology, thanatophobia, like that. So thanatophobia, thanato means fear of death, thanatophobia. Phobia means fear and thanatos mean death. So fear of death is thanatophobia and it causes uh, increased anxiety among each individual in this world. So basically, if you see every individual, it, it's, uh, it has anxiety, some anxiety about death and it is quite entirely normal part of a human condition. However, for some people, if you see the fear of death, What happens is, um, they, though they know that, um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So though they know that death is inevitable, still they cannot accept that uh, death, the prospect of death or dying. So this 
fear slowly starts interfering with their daily life and activities. And that is known as thanatophobia, that is fear or death anxiety. So in most extreme cases, if you see, people don't like to even step out of their home. It interferes from conducting their daily activities or they fear that even stepping out would cause death or any um, they would get contaminated with dangerous objects and such things like that. So this is actually the extreme case of death anxiety and the symptoms, if you see more or less, it would be uh, associated with anxiety symptoms, um, symptoms like um, distress, panic attacks, more panic attacks, uh, dizziness, sweating, heart palpitations, but they also undergo several emotional uh, symptoms like they avoid friends and family for a long long time they withdraw themselves into a shell they they actually uh, restrict their contacts with the outer world uh, and they have uh, anger sudden burst of anger they have anger towards everything they have hatred towards the world to the people they feel jealous about people who are living or they generally express anger most of the times and they also undergo sudden sadness which would be there for a longer time they always are gloomy and uh, they also suddenly they became agitated suddenly they become uh, sad suddenly they express anger and they also have a persistent worry so if a person undergoes such things then they have have the extreme uh, thanatophobia or death anxiety and if you see um, uh, uh, it is a conscious or unconscious psychological state some people might understand this as okay i am going through this sort of fear and i have to overcome that for some people it might be an unconscious state and according to sigmund freud he felt that it is uh, this death related fears are stemmed from the unresolved childhood conflicts and also as a result of defense mechanism. So if you see what are the ways we can overcome or how can this death anxiety be treated because it is going to be affected, uh, 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 it is going to affect the individual from conducting their day-to-day -day business. So if you see the first one is um, CBT, that is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. This is a way I, Cognitive sorry, sorry Behavioral the Therapy. No problem. I thought somebody was asking a doubt. So uh, if you see the CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, it alters the behave person's behavioral uh, patterns so that they form new behaviors and ways of thinking. So and the next one to help to overcome this death anxiety is psychotherapy. We all know it is a talking therapy where it involves talking through the anxieties and fears with a psychologist or a psychotherapist and they will find out what had caused this fear and they will come up with strategies to cope up with this anxiety. Then we have the exposure therapy where uh, it helps the person fear, uh, face their fears. Instead of burying, they help them to um, express how they feel about death and but they will be exposed in a very safe environment. For example, for a person who has death anxiety, they show pictures. First, they show a, a, a picture which has a distant scene of somebody dying and slowly, bit by bit, they introduce them into this concept. And finally, the person will be able to confront their thoughts, objects or feelings without fear. Then the next one is medication. We know that medication definitely helps when there is an anxiety issue like antidepressant or beta blockers but medication is always a, a short uh, term relief so you have to go for therapies or any other uh, solutions for a longer relief then a long term relief then we have the relaxation techniques in relaxation techniques like yoga definitely helps because yoga helps you to consciously see inside you know with your out your eyes it doesn't not only help you to see outside world, but actually makes you see inside you and understand who you are and thereby boosting the way how you can understand about your end or your death. And also like uh, meditation, deep breathing exercises, having a self-care, proper self-care and um, having a focus uh, on a positive imagery. So all this will help you to overcome this death, death anxiety. Then we move into the another concept called thanatology. Thanatology, as I told, everything will be related to thanatos. 
the Greek god of death. So thanatology is again a, a part of death psychology, a branch of death psychology. And the founder of it is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So she actually, uh, it is actually a scientific study and she wanted to make people aware of this uh, death awareness. So she wanted to create that awareness of death, which was started in UK and US in around 1950s. So she started to uh, um, advocate that how how people have to take the grief of either being a patient of a long term illness or a person who takes care of a patient who is having a terminal illness. So this basically is about uh, a, a scientific study of death, thanatology. And uh, as I told you, it was started in 1950s uh, in USA and UK. Now, only we have seen these are the ideas from Western theories. So have the death not been discussed in eastern parts of uh, uh, of the world like eastern uh, in eastern religions yes eastern religions if you see they mainly focused on death they help an individual to understand what death is and how it can be uh, how an individual can overcome the fear because giving the knowledge or empowering a person with the knowledge actually makes him overcome that fear so here we are going to see about three main religions of uh, eastern world that is hinduism buddhism and jainism so um I, I'm going to show you a figure. I want you to uh, watch it for 10 seconds closely. So you see two things, a black and a white ladies. And you can see uh, um, a baby right from the womb. It just uh, goes to various life stages. And then if you see the other side, your left-hand side, there will be a man who grows middle age adult, old, older, and then finally, he, he falls off to death. So the above figure actually depicts the transmigration of the soul from one body to the another. So even from a human body, one may transmigrate to the lower form of a body, such as plants, animals. If you see down, you can see the various different lower forms other than human beings, plant, insect, or animal. Now, what decides our next body? So we are actually forced to take up another body according to our consciousness at the time of death. So this is the main core of all the Eastern religions. So they all advocate a rebirth cycle where once you die, your soul is immortal and it transfers to the next body. And there the birth you are going to take in your next cycle would be based on the thought, the conscious thought when you are having at the time of death. So when we first see about Hinduism, in Hinduism, if you see, it celebrates, Hinduism actually celebrates death. And the death practices are most probably the more most important in Hinduism than in any other religion. Um, they always, it is, uh, they always advocate that each human being or each birth or each person is predestined to innumerable rebirths and one's karma or one's action uh, determines both the length of each life and specific form of each rebirth so this is the main core of hinduism so whatever action you do in this karma in this lifetime you will be reaping that in the next lifetime so uh, it goes with that word, as you sow, so shall you reap. So every grain you sown in this existence is reaped in the next. So when we see about this, first we'll see about Vedas. What Vedas has to tell about uh, death. So if you see the um, Rig Veda, which is the oldest form, which may be dated around uh, 1500 BC. So it is also known as the Song of Creation. Here, it's very beautifully, I want all of you to listen to this. It's very beautifully mentioned that death was not there, it states, nor was there aught immortal. So when the world was there first created, death was not there and there was no immortal as well. The two world was total void except for one thing, breathe breathless. Yet breathed by its own nature. So here, this is the first recorded insight into the importance of respiration for the potential life. So Rig Veda actually mentions, so we uh, in the um, modern biology, 
we also say that unicellular organism was the first one which has to be formed. So this is that, except one thing, breathless, yet breathed by its own nature. Um, then we have actually the next, there is a parable also. I, I would say not a parable, it's an allegory. So in Vedas, there is normally the uh, important aspects are given through very uh, uh, beautiful stories, which would be three or four lines, but the meaning would be very deep. So in this, if you see, there is once you know, a man was drowning in the sea and there was a sage who was uh, sitting on the beach and he cried for help, the so sage helped him. So, but how did he help? He just brought the cloth of the person. So now you will certainly agree with me that the effort of the sage was in vain because he didn't actually help the person. He has just brought the cloth. So this simple allegory here is to illustrate that mere saving of the body will not save the soul. So your body is like a cloth. So if you save your body, you're not saving the soul. So this allegory is very beautifully mentioned in Veda. Then we go into the Upanishads. Upanishads, you know, is actually uh, gives you solutions for all the problems that even now which we are facing under the sun, any problem you have an answer in Upanishads. But it is cryptic and we have to have the knowledge to understand it. In almost, uh, there are 108 Upanishads and out of it, 10 are classified as Mukhya Upanishads. And in that, most of the 10 Upanishads speaks about death. But... Katha Upanishad, which is known as the secret of death, speaks invariably in length about and breadth about death. So there are Upanishads and Upanishads, mostly it's in the form of dialogues between a, a guru and a disciple or between husband and wife or between two sages or between a king and a, a sage. So it goes like a dialogue where somebody will ask a question and the uh, knowledgeable person will be giving the answer. And if you see, most of the answers can be fitted into our current life as well. So if you see the secret of death in the, is Katha Upanishad. In that, I would give only one example between Nachiketa and Yama. So the Yama, Nachiketa was a small boy around five years who was sacrificed by his father to Lord Yama. So when he went to the abode of uh, death, he uh, Lord Yama had gone out somewhere. So the boy patiently waited outside the doors for nearly three days. So when um, Yama came back, he was surprised by the persistence of the child and he was so happy that he said, I'll give you three boons. Whatever you ask, I can give you. So the first boon, he said, I want to go back to my father and live happily with my family. Yes, granted. Second one, he was asking some similar things. The third was a very important thing. He asked, since you are the God of death, tell me what is death? What happens after death? What happens before death? What happens to the soul? Is man a mortal or immortal? Can immortality, can, can it be achieved? So Yama was taken back and he said, you are a small boy, even many sages for thousands of years, they are doing penance to understand this. How can you, how can I tell you this? This is the secret. I cannot tell you, but he said, you ask anything else in the world, I will give you. He said, no, you ask for me a boon. I, this is my boon. Please grant it. So then after many of, uh, he couldn't, uh, like Yama couldn't convince. So finally he, in Katha Upanishad, it is full about death, what happens to a body, what happens to your soul, what happens to a man when he's afraid of death. So in crux, I'll tell you, so it, it is divided into valley. So in the second valley of Katha Upanishad, he asserts, that is Yama asserts, that man must not fear anyone or anything, not even death, as the true essence of man, which is his Atman, is neither born nor dies. It is always immortal. So this is the crux of uh, Katha Upanishad or the secret of death. So a man never, that is a soul of you never dies. Only the body changes. It never, it, it doesn't go with your soul. Your soul doesn't go with your body. So that is the crux of Katha Upanishad. Now we move into the other one which is Ramayana. Ramayana, if you see, very beautifully explained uh, the uh, justice and other things are there. But uh, again, when connected to death, this part is called as Bali's death, where Tara's lamentation is very beautifully described by Valmiki. So when Tara hears about the death of Vali, she undergoes certain stages, like five stages of grief, which is explained in the modern uh, psychology as the grief uh, stages of 
grief by Elizabeth Kubler Rose in 1960s. But this was given by Valmiki several thousand of years before. So let me explain this very quickly. So when Tara heard the death of Wali, the first mode she went was denial. She said, no, nobody can kill Wali. Wali is very strong. He is a superhuman. He cannot be uh, defeated by anyone. So I will not accept that Wali has died. So she was in a denial mode for, uh, for a short stage of time. Then once the truth uh, was there, then she had to accept it. Then what the next one was anger. She was lashing out of trauma. How could you do this? You had killed my husband unfairly. Otherwise, nobody could have killed Wali. So she took out all her anger and frustration. Why did you kill Wali? What did he do to you? You didn't have any problem with him. So the full anger and frustration, she lashed out on Rama and the others. Then after that, then Rama convinced her. He explained his side of uh, um, uh, justice and everything. Then slowly she started bargaining. So that once that stage settled, then she started into bargaining. See, you know, Wali is very strong. Bring him back to life. So uh, he had already won Ravana. Within a fraction of a second, he can go and get Ravana and bring him back to you. Bring your wife to you. He, will, he can kill Ravana in a second. So bring his life back. If you want, you take my life. So there was a bargaining going on. Why, why Wali? You should have not killed him. He would be the best ally for you. Then again, Rama explained all the things. And then after that, she went into a stage of depression. What will I do without Wali? What will happen to my son Angata? What will happen to this kingdom? Who will look after him? So there was a deep, how will I exist without Wali? So sort of deep depression and sad face went through. And then finally, she accepted whatever Rama was selling. So Rama counseled her in a way that she can overcome the depression. So again, that is a very beautiful, that, uh, that itself is a separate yeah. webinar we can take. So yes, it yes. is like, so here, finally, she accepted saying that, okay, I understand and accept that Wali cannot be brought back. I accept what you are saying. I know that you will do good to Angata. I know whatever you have done is good. And I accept to whatever you say. So these are the five stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, which is beautifully shown as the stages of grief in Ramayana. It is, it is Tara's lamentation on Wali's death. Then we move on to Mahabharata. Again, in Mahabharata, there is a very um, important episode called Yaksha Prasna. So in Yaksha Prasna in um, Mahabharata, it, it is one of the finest situations which brings the limelight of uh, uh, the excellent character of Yudhishthira. And also it provides a set of answers to many significant problems of our life. If you read the question and answers between the Yaksha and Yudhishthira, you will understand that the current problems which we are facing the each everyday dilemma which we go through are being answered here so in that if you see um that's uh, a, when um um, Pandava with Draupati, they reach the Dvaitavana. They feel very exhausted after the extreme long journey and are very thirsty. So Yudhishthira sends a Nakula to find a pond nearby to fetch water and come. But he doesn't come back. Then he sends one by one of his uh, uh, brothers, but none of them come back. So what happens is uh, Yudhishthira now, he himself goes uh, goes in search of, the, uh, of his brothers and the water. So there uh, near the pond, he finds uh, all his four brothers lying uh, they are dead, but they look like they're sleeping. There is no hurt on their body and no wounds around, and there is no uh, scene of fighting or war. So now he understands that there is there should be something mysteriously happening. When he was about to touch the water, then he hears the voice of the Yaksha, which uh, he answers. So Yaksha says, see, if you unless you answer all my questions correctly, I will not allow you to drink water. So Yudhishthira says, yes, ask me. Then what happens is exactly um, the beautiful question which he asks about death. Yaksha says, what is the greatest wonder in the world? And you know what Yudhishthira says? Every day people are dry, dying and reaching the abode of death. Still, the living desire to live forever. Could that... Could there be a greater wonder than that? Seeing people die, still people wanted to have the immortality. They want to live forever. They are not happy with uh, welcoming the death. They see it is inevitable. Still, they want to cling on death. So this is very, very important uh, idea, which was given in Yaksha Prasna in our Mahabharata. 
Then we move to our Bhagavad Gita. I want you again to look into this. So there's a beautiful uh, shloka, Dehino Yasmin. Um, just a second. Dehino Yasmin Yata Dehe Kaumaram Yavanam Zara Tata Dehantra Praptir Diharas Tatra Na Muhyati. So when you understand this, I'll, uh, it's very beautiful thing. As the embodied soul continuously passes in this body, that is Dehino Yasmin Tata Dehe, from boyhood to youth to old age, Kaumaram Yavanam Jara, that is from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes to another body at the at death. So, Tata Dehantra Praptir. So, a sober person or a wise person is not frightened by such a change. Diras Tatrana Muhyati. So, here if you see, Are you able to see my screen? Ha, no. Apologies, just give me a second. You're able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, yes, sir, sorry for you. this. Yeah, so this is where the how a body changes from boyhood to youth to adult, same way your soul changes bodies. So there is a wise person is never afraid of death. So this picture actually uh, helps you to understand this beautiful shloka from Bhagavad Gita. So these are the ideas which are given in our uh, scriptures in Hinduism about death. Now we move into the another important religion, Buddhism. So what does Buddhism speak about? So if you see in Buddhism, there is a very uh, nice parable, which is called as the parable of the mustard seed. So this uh, story actually uh, makes you understand the importance of death in Buddhism, how they looked at death. So once there was, uh, this story is found in Theravada Buddhism, which is the oldest text of Buddhism. So it revolves around a, a woman called uh, Kisa Gautami. So Kisa Gautami was living in the time of uh, Buddha and her son, uh, her youngest son died at a very young age. So she was... Uh, with deep sorrow and grief. And she went into to each house in her village begging to bring her son back to life. Though the uh, villagers were, were pitying on her, but they couldn't do much. So what they did was they um, asked, one of the neighbors asked her to go and see Buddha because he is an enlightened soul and he can help to bring your son back to life. So she ran towards Buddha and she pleaded with him to help bring his son back. So um, Buddha told that definitely I will help you, but only one item I need to prepare the medicine. Please um, get or gather some mustard seeds from the household of those who have never been touched by death. So this was the only one condition to get the mustard seed. From those mustard seeds, he promised that I will make the medicine which will bring your son back to life. So she went relieved. She went all to pillars to post in the whole village. She was searching for a house which can give her the mustard seeds. So all of her neighbors were willing to give her the mustard seeds, but they all told her that their household has been touched by death. They told her that the living are few, but the dead are many. So uh, at the day became evening and then night and still she was not having even a single mustard seed that she has been instructed to collect. Now she re then she realized the universality of death. According to Buddhist verse, this story actually makes you to understand that it is not just a truth for one village or a town, nor it is a truth for a single family, but for the world, every world that is settled by gods or men, this is what is true. What is that? Impermanence. So with this new understanding, her grief was calmed. She buried her son in the forest, then returned to Buddha. And she told him that she was not able to collect the mustard seeds. And then she had understood what uh, death is and how it is there all over the world and what impermanence is. So basically, it is very difficult to take the grief of a, a death of a loved one 
but it you it, death is inevitable so you cannot avoid that and what is the main teaching of buddha to control or to come overcome this or uh, this impermanence stop the rebirth circle so cycle so you need not uh, come into the cycle of rebirth how can you not come into the cycle uh, of rebirth by controlling your karmas so we have a very important uh, uh, theory here in buddhist also like karma so karma is a system of cause and effect in buddhism so what they say is whatever good deeds karma is nothing but our deeds or actions so whatever good deeds you bring you do gives you a good effect whatever bad deeds you do gives you a bad effect in your next rebirth or your rebirth cycle continues the quality of the main point here is the quality of an individual's death and rebirth is also influenced by their karma and the thoughts at the dying bed so this is very very important so basically this is the crux of uh, buddhism that a person if you want to stop your uh, uh, impermanence or your uh, rebirth then be an enlightened one how do you do that by doing good karma so he had given that in the form of four noble truths life has inevitable suffering there is cause to our suffering that's our karma and there is an end to our suffering and how do we do that through the eightfold path right intention right speech right action right livelihood right effort right concentration right mindfulness and right view so these are the ideas of buddhism and they also speak about the dying moments so in buddhist culture it is believed that a good death is one in which the individual is conscious and aware what is happening to them so that is according to them a good death and the last moments of life can be affected can affect the nature of the rebirth so how does the more calm and prepared you are the better their rebirth is and it is considered also that the last thought of thought of an individual will shape his rebirth future rebirth uh, but you can think okay fine when i'm going to die i will pray to god i will be calm i will understand but they clearly say that it is dictated by your prayer kar prayer karma so whatever bad deed if you do then at that time you will not be able to realize what's happening to you right so it is believed basically that death occurs after the last breath has been taken and you should be conscious of it and you should have good thoughts about when you're dying and what happens after death in buddhism so uh, basically in tibetan buddhism after the last breath is taken the individual is in an intermediate state between their previous life and the new life this state is called as bardo and they it can last up to 49 days but in um, in certain countries like um, sri lanka or laos or thailand where they practice theravada they say that uh, they believe that the intermediate state that is the bardo is up to 7 days only and in certain buddhist doctrines they also say that rebirth is immediate so there are certain discrepancies here and there but the main thing is rebirth is there and it depends on the karma of what you do now we go into the next important religion jainism so jainism we know that it is uh, 2500 plus years old and it is followed by 3 to 4 millions of people most of them living in india and ahimsa or non violence is the main idea or hallmark of the uh, spiritual discipline so here when we see about that they also go through the karma or the impurity of the soul that is bound to the cycle of rebirth is due to the karma what you do so karma is built up through the actions in this world through your thoughts words deeds uh, attitudes and how do you reduce or eliminate karma so that you can achieve moksha it is to um, do uh, go into the enlightened form so how do you attain that by doing good karma and reducing the bad effect of your life so here jains believe actually that uh, practicing ascetism is can burn away karma and bringing forth the truth jiva so you can be an enlightened person if you uh, are able to burn away your karma as long as a person is alive a according to them they keep on he or she keeps on accumulating the karma and causing again and again rebirth into the samsara which is a cause of pain and misery and continuous uh, sorrow 
So what they do is, is some Jains actually, they have a practice called Salekana. So in this, it is to ensure a favorable rebirth by burning karma at the end of the life. This process, Salekana, is like they fast to death. That is a conscious effort. To, they actually, they desire and they fast to death. Though it is not mandatory, it is um, many, uh, it and it requires permission from the religious leader. It is done by many Jains uh, each year, usually by the elderly or terminally ill. What they do is they fast to death, accompanied by intensive meditation and reflection upon life. So they consciously choose that uh, they fast to death and they would be thinking of good uh, thoughts or actions. They do good actions during that time. So this Salekana is very, very important process in Jains of, ab about death. Then uh, we also, there is also, there are many, uh, 17, I think 17 types of Maranas uh, according to Jainism, but out of the two Maranas are very important. So one is called Akama Marana and Sakama Marana. So Akama Marana refers to someone who has attachment to life and doesn't want to die, but dies when the life is over. So according to them, uh, according to Jains, he has died uh, helplessly, not in his own accord, because he is um, he doesn't understand the concepts of rebirth, other worlds, or liberation of soul. He is ignorant. He is very ignorant, and he is willingly or unwillingly he dies. So when he dies unwillingly, without understanding these concepts, it is a very low death. It is called as akama marana. Whereas sakama marana refers to someone who is not afraid of death and who accepts it willingly and at ease goes with it. They understand that there is no way to avoid death and this is a natural process and the soul will continue whereas uh, the body will perish. So this is a Sakama Marana which they consider it to be the highest or good form of death. So these are the two main uh, uh, important uh, death philosophies which they have in Jainism. Now uh, we have finished with the Eastern religions and what they have told about death. Now, what are the causes for death? Basically in the whole world, if you see, uh, except from the pandemic, normally in the 20th century, we see that uh, common causes for death was infectious diseases and uh, which brought death very quickly. But due to the advancement of medical medicines and other things, what happened was, uh, chronic diseases actually started to take the important place in death. So um, out of uh, uh, the whole uh, percentage, 73.8 percentage are uh, taken by the chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, accidents, uh, lower respiratory, stroke, Al Alzheimer's, diabetes. So if you see, most of them are based on your lifestyle. The more happy, the more self-care you give to yourself, though we cannot have an immortal life, but we can extend a, a happy life or you can choose the way you die rather than having going, going through the chronic diseases where uh, the pain and suffering is much more longer. And uh, when we see about the aspects of death, what are the aspects of death, what are the things connected with death? We have three main things, physiological, phys physiological death. We know that when your heart dies, when your, uh, when your respiration stops, so, and uh, your body gives up. So that is a physiological death. So that is first aspect of death where it is end and we do not realize anything about it. The second one is social death, which happens much before your physiological death. So if a person is uh, known to have a terminal uh, disease, what happens is you know, the friends and family members may feel that they do not know what to talk to them or they cannot offer any solutions to relieve their pain. So slowly they stop uh, coming or talking or communicating to them because they also undergo the grief and they don't know how to communicate. Most of the cases it happens and the person who who is undergoing this uh, uh, process will also feel uh, very inadequate. He also feels that he has nothing to give to the society and he withdraws himself so that he doesn't want to speak to his family, friends and everybody. So that is the social death which happens, happens much before the physiological death. And there is one more death, physio, physio, uh, psychological death, which also happens uh, much before the physiological death and accompanies more or less at the same time of social death or a little later or before. So here what happens is the person is unable to 
take or digest the fact that he is going to die. And the pain and suffering which he goes through through his physical body also gives immense stress and anxiety to his mind. And he himself will not be able to communicate what he goes through. And the same way the friends and families and the caretakers who are going or the loved ones who are going to look at him also without their knowledge in the form of sympathy they start to put on certain things which affects mentally the ill person and the person uh, the, uh, who's taking care also goes to tremendous pressure and anxiety during that stage so the psychological death actually if you see they withdraw and regress themselves towards uh, inside them so they regress into their own self. And uh, if you see um, this sort of psychological death or social death will bring your death much closer before it is actually to be done. So these are the aspects of death which we all need to know. Then we have the attitudes of death. So when you see the attitudes um, of death, what are the attitudes? Attitudes means how you feel about death. During our lifetime, we pass through certain ages, like uh, we are young, then we move into uh, childhood, uh, first infancy, childhood, then young adult, uh, adolescent, young adult, middle age, old age. So various uh, ages we pass through. And those in each stage, we have a different attitude towards or a different feeling or a different uh, vision towards death. So how does it look? So basically, first, when we start with infants, infants has no concept of death. They, they, they feel that they, they have no connection with death and they don't feel anything towards death. Then the perceptions of death actually starts to develop in the middle or late childhood. But even then what they feel is at that age, for example, uh, until the age of five, uh, they lack the appreciation of death and it is seen as a separation for most of them. And they don't feel that uh, uh, death is uh, the final one. So they feel, yeah, my grandmother can come back after three months, four months. So the idea or the feeling is just a separation of loss, but not the ultimate or the final one. Then um, they, they know that it is okay. Then the second stage, like around uh, um, seven to 10, 10 years, or I, I would say approximately till nine years. So what they feel is the death is final, but it is not inevitable. So they feel that, okay, yeah, uh, only old people die, people who are young like my parents or my loved ones or my friends, uh, death will not touch them. So that is the idea when they are between that age group from five to nine. Then the pre-adolescent stage between 10, uh, nine or 10, like that, when they go, they understand that, yes, death is final and inevitable. And and uh, the prospect of uh, mortality also, they seem to accept it, though they cannot process it properly, but still they know that it is inevitable. When they move into the adolescent age of 12 to 18, they develop more abstract concepts about death. So they are, uh, they are able to connect it that everybody, death touches everybody and it is inevitable. And they also fear about death and all that happens. When you move into adult, the very important one, um, there is a very uh, interesting research paper which said that actually older people, older adults, they do not fear death because they understand at that stage that death is inevitable. What they fear is about the process of dying. How will I die? Will it be a painful death or will it be a sudden death? Will I be aware of death or will I be going suddenly? All that would be the thought. thought. Whereas the middle aged adults are the ones who fear more about death than the process. They fear death. Oh, suddenly if it comes, what will happen about my family? So the middle age people are the one who uh, are afraid of death and the young adults as usual they know death is inevitable but they enjoy life because they're full of youth and less responsibility so they take uh, death as another aspect of life they don't see it as a threatening one so these are the aspects or uh, various attitudes of death now uh, we come into the 
Bereavement and Grief, Dabda, which was given by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which I had already explained you through the Ramayana's Bali's uh, uh, death scene and Tara's lamentation. Here, very briefly, I will explain you denial. So uh, most of the patients would be going into this denial form. So they will be, um, it is usually, a, what to say, a temporary shock response. So uh, they avoid uh, people, they avoid, they don't talk. They will be saying, no, I, it will not happen to me. Uh, it would, it cannot happen. See, if you say suddenly to a, a person who is not smoking, saying that you have lung cancer, the first thing is, how come? I don't have any bad habits. I don't drink. I go, I don't. Uh, then what happens is we go to the anger. The next mode is anger. So they start fighting with God and saying, why me? Why? Why should I? They feel that uh, others are more deserving than me. There are people, there are people who drink, there are people who are smoking, but why did you choose me? So they keep on, they, uh, they actually envy others who are uh, happy, healthy, and uh, they are enjoying life. Why this person experiences pain? So here the anger and frustration is shown in different uh, capacities. Then bargaining. This is a very brief stage and uh, normally they start uh, bargaining with the God. It is uh, very difficult for us to understand, but it goes through. If he's a spiritual person, he said, see, if God is not responding to my anger, then maybe if I do good, he will respond and he will somehow miraculously make my uh, uh, disease go away. So he starts bargaining in that way. Then we have the depression. So this is, um, he starts the uh, losses yet to come. He goes into the depression mode or the past losses which he or she had gone through. So they keep on thinking about all those things. And final stage is acceptance. This is not a happy stage, of course, but, uh, and it is usually void of feelings. There will be absolutely no feelings and it will take a while to reach the stage, but it will come. Finally, the person accepts. And these stages also uh, goes for the person who is taking care or the loved one who is taking care or who has recently lost a loved one. They all going go through the stages of grief. It might not be in the same order like denial, anger, bargaining. It might be denial, bargaining, anger or denial, depression or depression, denial, anger. So, But these five stages are there, but in any order based on each individual. Now, how to overcome this? Oh, uh, before that, we'll see the other models of uh, this one, uh, grief. We have five interesting models on this. One is called Warden model in 1991. So he explained the process of grief, how to process the grief through set of four different tasks. So it is like accepting the loss, then working through it, experiencing the pain, and then adjusting the changes. So this is the Warden model, which he gave in 1991. Then it is Parks model, which Parks gave in 1998. So he broke down grief into four stages. That is shock, yearning, despair, and recovery. This is more or less like Kubler-Ross theory, which he had made into four. Instead of five, he had put four stages. But, um, and he has also in this, he has characterized about the emotions, thoughts, and behaviors where each one goes through. And he has also processed certain feelings in this model. And when we go to the third one by Straub and Shutt in 1999, he had combined both Warden and Parks model. What he had done is he had given the process of grief and how to overcome, how to work through the grief also. So he had given uh, the restoration more oriented more um, process as well as the ongoing process of grief. And then we have the course model. Course model speaks about individual empowerment and also mainly he gives the guidelines for caregivers in this model. And as Latin um, model where she refer terms life themes in a dying person. So these are the five important uh, models of grief. Now, what are the th therapies which we can uh, do for overcoming this grief? See, we initially start, uh, saw how we can overcome the uh, death anxiety or thanatophobia. Now, if there is a grief, how? what are the therapies which uh, uh, helps you to overcome? First one is, as usual, CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the best when it comes to the psychology of death. So, we know that it identifies the negative thought patterns and uh, helps you to work to change them. 
Next, we have the um, Acceptance and Commitment Theory Act. So here, uh, this therapy helps you to accept the negative emotions and the situations and then how to uh, create or develop healthy patterns. So it helps in stages like accepting first your negative feelings, then distancing yourself from the negative feelings, focusing on the present. The next step would be focusing on the present then observing yourself, experiencing different situations and circumstances, then identifying your values and finally overcoming difficulties through use of various techniques. So this is the ACT therapy. Then there is a traumatic grief therapy where there is a sudden loss or a trauma created by grief. Then um, this therapy looks at trauma response and grief, and it is usually associated with um, uh, sudden death or unexpected death. This therapy usually associates itself with that. Then there is a complicated grief therapy, G CGT. So this involves address of symptoms of complicated grief. This grief actually will be like a feelings of hopelessness or grief for a very long time, intense sadness. So this, uh, uh, those who experience uh, grief, uh, complicated grief actually uh, they help to understand and fixate the person they lost and the, they help to understand the circumstances surrounding the death. So this normally includes the ACT therapy in it. Then we have the group therapy. Group therapy for small groups where individuals gather to share their thoughts and feelings and uh, support groups give them the brave, offer them a brave and safe space where you can uh, share and heal in a confidential, supportive, loving uh, environment. Then we have the art therapy where you know that expression, expression of uh, uh, your creativity helps you to reduce the grief or the sadness which you go through. So it's a self-expression of your grief. So this has a very great uh, healing effect painting, drawing, coloring, making color collages, or even sculpting are all common activities during an art therapy. Then there is a play therapy. Play therapy involves the use of imaginative or other play tips. So this play therapy is very useful for mainly children because they're unable to articulate their feelings and emotions and problems they are experiencing. Uh, the two after a significant loss, they are not able to express themselves. So this play therapy gives them an outlet to air and helps them to express themselves, which would be very useful for their um, recovery, grief recovery. Uh, before ending, I would like to uh, mention this word, uh, the sentence given by Mori, the most important thing in life is to learn how to give out love and to let it come in. So this was uh, told by Mori in a book called Tuesdays with Mori by Mitch Album. So I have given a set of books, which uh, would really be better if you are interested to more and overcome this uh, thought of thing. So this book, uh, I hope you are able to see Tuesdays with Mori is a very, very beautiful book by Mitch Albom. Uh, it's about a professor who speaks, who is on the uh, death, uh, who has an illness where he will eventually die and how the life philosophies is given through, uh, through dialogues and conversations between a student and a teacher. Teacher uh, Mitch Albom was the student and Mori was the teacher. It's a very nice book. And Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl here, again, um, this is existential, existential uh, therapy where choice is given to you. At, I, even at your bad time, even in your deathbed, choice is given to you whether you want to take uh, according to your values or you're moving away due to your anger. So existential therapy is very good. And uh, Victor E. Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, also gives you a very great insight into death and how you can choose your path even when you're facing difficulties. And Ikigai uh, by Hector. to interrupt, uh, Ms. Vasumati, we are actually running out of time. So if yeah, that's finish, it. This is the last one on okay. grief and grieving and denial of death by Ernest Becker. It's okay that you are not okay. Meeting grief, grief and loss in the culture that doesn't understand by Megan. So this is the end of uh, my uh, webinar. Thank you so much for patiently listening. I will stop the sharing. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. you can ask questions. Excuse me, ma'am. Hello. Thanks a lot for the wonderful. Excuse me, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, very good evening.
Uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful presentation, ma'am. Uh, I have a doubt. The grief theory which you had mentioned, I had read about it in the uh, research methodology too, that it is used in ethnographic studies and uh, uh, as part of uh, coursework for research methodology for my PhD. Um, yes, yes. See, uh, many, see, these stages are very common for every individual all over the world. It is not specific to any culture. So it okay. is basically, if you see any culture, anything uh, goes, any individual belonging to any culture goes through the stages. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you so Thank much, Ms. Rasmati. It was like immensely enchanting. We thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Uh, whatever you, knowledge you have shared about the Eastern philosophy, the Western philosophy. Uh, I'm sure like after listening to you, everybody will, you know, now start speaking about it, be aware of their feelings and also understand how to overcome the fear of death. So ladies and gentlemen, we are coming towards the end of our session. So I'm sharing the feedback form link in the chat box. Uh, if you fill up the form, then you'll receive the participation certificate in your email inbox. I would request everybody to double check the email ID you are giving because the email ID you, are, you will be giving, that's the email ID in which you will be receiving the certificates. We would uh, also you, like Ms. to Prayanta. felicitate uh, Ms. Vasumati with the certificate of appreciation. Uh, I'll just show you on the screen. Just give me a second so that I can share my screen. Sure. Meanwhile, I thank all the participants for patiently listening through. I know it has extended by six minutes or seven minutes. I think it is because of the uh, interruption we had in between. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any uh, queries or anything, you can mail uh, to me. I'm giving my email ID here. So you can always mail to me. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Priyanka, for this beautiful thing. Yeah, we, we will email this certificate of appreciation to you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. And a special thanks to you, Ms. Vasumati. Uh, let us take a group photo by switching on all our videos. And I can go to a gallery view. And then we can have a group photo. I'd request everybody to please switch on your videos. I'll have to take three photographs for the number of participants. Please bear with me for a minute. I can still see a lot of people not uh, switching on their videos, but yeah, I can see all of your names still. Once again, I'll say thank you so much for being with us. I hope to meet all of you soon in our next webinar. We'll share the details in the WhatsApp and other social media accounts like always. Please fill up the feedback form, which I have uh, shared with you earlier and share once again. And you will receive the certificates in the group, in your email ID, I'm sorry. Thank you so
so much everybody i am ending this session over here thank you all for the participation and thank you so much ms masumati once again for giving us this immense information and knowledge thank you take care goodbye everybody